Um, this session between now and lunchtime, our session three, data-driven mobility. So data is being generated in all sorts of different ways. Can we thoughtfully harness that to help us develop more effective, more appropriate, uh, more valued mobility systems and services uh, within the urban area? That's our challenge. And again, we've got, we've got five of the five-minute presentations just to open up some possibilities, some ideas, some research going on. Then we'll have another conversation around it. So delighted to um, start with uh, Nicholas uh, Ocalano, uh, senior data scientist at Fitness Keeper. So whenever you see someone jogging along in Boston, looking out for those driverless vehicles, um, uh, it'll probably they'll probably have an app uh, that uh, Nick's company is involved in, uh, and and there must be a shed load of data that you're getting hold of, and be that's fascinated to know term, yes. why you're doing it uh, and what you're going to do with it. So over to you. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. All right, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Nick. Am I on and everything? Yeah. All right, good. So hi, I'm Nick. I'm the senior data scientist at uh, RunKeeper. Um, I'm actually the only data scientist at RunKeeper. Uh, <laughs> so you get to be, you get to be the most senior. Uh, so what we. <laughs> I insisted on that, actually. Uh, so we make mobile and web apps for uh, fitness tracking, motivation, and guidance. Um, and I'm really excited to be here and part of this conversation. Uh, this is a little, you know, I'm coming at this from kind of a different angle. Um, you know, one of our models is movement is freedom. Uh, it's actually it's right here in my, my wristband. Uh, and so our users, they, they have places that they need to go. Uh, but they want to get there in a way that, um, you know, they want to run, uh, bike, walk. They want to get there in a way that they're connected physically with their mode of transportation. They get exercise. They get exhilaration. Uh, so it's kind of different from, like, I mean, maybe, I don't know, driverless car would be pretty cool, too. Uh, but, um, and actually, I didn't, I didn't think of this until today. I'd kind of forgotten about it. But earlier this year, we had a, uh, like, a little publicity stunt where we ran uh, a race against the Beeline, which, for those of you who aren't uh, local, uh, the Beeline is like the most reviled of the Boston trains. It's got like a bazillion stops. It takes forever to get anywhere. So we tried to see if we could beat it, uh, you know, in a four-mile race. And we just we we did just, but I didn't beat it. Um, <laughs> but when some people did, you know, our fastest runners did beat it, uh, and they had to run like a sub six-minute mile for four miles, which is fast. Uh, but it made me think, you know, what like why not run, even if it takes ten minutes or fifteen minutes longer. Uh, you know, why, why aren't pe more people doing that instead of riding the train? So you can get exercise and get where you need to go at the same time. Um, so just briefly about our company, we're local. Uh, we started in 2008, we're based in Boston. There's about 50 of us and I'm part of a small four person data team. Um, and our primary product is the RunKeeper app uh, where people use, uh, use it to uh, GPS and manually track running, walking, cycling, other fitness activities. They can set long-term goals, training plans. It gives them performance insights on a wide variety of platforms. Um, and so what you get out of this product is all of this data. We have more than 37 million users right now. So I've generated about 450 million fitness activities, most, most of which are GPS tracked. So there's 200 billion GPS points describing uh, these users' behavior. Uh, and then we also just have all these interactions and events, what they do with the app, what goals they set, you know, physical things they view inside the product. So it's a huge amount of data. Uh, and I guess you know, the reason anybody here should care to talk to me, uh, I mean, I'm a nice person to talk to, but what's relevant for, for you guys is that our users' data can teach us a lot about human mobility. So. Um, Am I? I'm like one behind. Why didn't anybody tell me I was one behind on every slide? Um, what? Ah, okay. So the reason, <laughs> just speaking up. Um, so our users' data can teach us a lot about human mobility. So my, my colleague Margaret uh, made this lovely map where, you know, pull a bunch of random runs and you can see, oh, look, this is where people run in New York City. Uh, when somebody like me looks at this map, uh, what they see is all these problems, right? Like, where, where did this data come from? Was it iPhone or Android users? Was it uh, men or women, rich people or poor people? And all the answers to those questions affect the conclusions that we draw from this data. It affects the policy decisions we should make from it. And, you know, if we were just to go sell this data, there's a whole host of issues that would go into making that decision, which is why we currently don't sell our data, because I don't feel we can make those decisions well. 
So the real question for me is, how can we use our data responsibly uh, you know, for the greater good, but uh, teach people how to use it well, uh, protect our users' privacy and security, uh, and really do a good job of this? So you know, I apologize. I'm really coming here with more uh, questions than answers. But the questions I, that I would like to learn about are, you know, what are the things that we can learn from data like ours? How do we understand the biases and the limitations of these data in a way that helps us partner with other people to use it well? Uh, you know, how do we communicate those limitations? How do we do all this in a way that protects users' privacy and security? Anonymization is hard. Geo-anonymization is really hard. You know, how do you do this right? Uh, and then how do we educate users about the ways that we use their data? And being a consumer product, how do we do that without scaring them off? Uh, you know, the, the like, run keeper is tracking your location thing that pops up on the iPhone is kind of scary, and a lot of people want to turn that off. And how do we say, well, maybe you shouldn't if you can trust us to do good things with it? And that's a big if, you know. So those are the questions I'm coming here with. Uh, that's all I've got. There you go. Look at that. Right, well, we hope that all your questions will be answered within the next 10 years, but they're questions that, that maybe are ones that are floating around a lot of this issue. Um, so our next um, presentation, delighted that uh, Odid Katz is here, assistant professor uh, from the Delft University of Technology, also um, uh, the Department of Transport and Planning, I think, and you're looking in Amsterdam Institute of Advanced uh, Metropolitan Solutions very much about uh, this issue of real-time multimodal traffic management systems using big data. So it would be very interesting to know what you're learning from that and how it's informing your planning. Thank you. you want to turn, this, to turn on, this on? Yeah, Here? that's right. Uh, yeah. You can have his th 12 seconds as well. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, so I'm going to spend, uh, after this uh, stimulating presentation, a few minutes uh, just sharing some, of, uh, some information and some enthusiasm about the new institution that is now being kicked off in Amsterdam, AMS that you might have heard of. It's a collaboration between a number of partners, including MIT and TU Delft in the Netherlands, but also IBM, Cisco, um, Shell, the city of Boston, and other partners. Um, and it is, let me, yeah. Uh, and it's actually an institution which is not limited to transportation, uh, which is the focus that we discussed today, but it's also about any other inflow and outflow of any kind of uh, data, information, uh, material, goods, people, uh, electricity, water, uh, you name it, waste, information into urban metropolitan areas. Um, so I want to share some of the challenges we have and some of the ideas of uh, what we want to do about it. Um, in the case of Amsterdam, and also in many other cities, of course, in metropolitan areas which are very attractive to people to live in, to work at, to enjoy life at, uh, we have issues of crowding uh, and crowd management. And this is prevalent in public transport systems, uh, in uh, biking facilities, in big events, um, and in the public transport system overall. Um, and then the question is, how do we maintain cities attractive by managing crowds, uh, hopefully in real time, and being able to do it in an effective way? So to this end, we, uh, at EU Delft, we now just kicked off a new project within AMS, uh, the first project that has been launched, which is called Orbital Mobility Lab, UML in short, uh, which is about how we can collect, synthesize, uh, and make sense out of big data in transport, capitalizing on the amount, a big amount of data that is available in the case of Amsterdam. So here are just a few examples when it comes to traffic data with, um, from cars, just as the TomTom, -tom, for example, or Waze, uh, bike-sharing bike facilities, this is from London, uh, social media, such as tweets, um, and then how can we make sense of all these different kind of data about activities that people carry out and the modes that we use um, and the crowds that are, and how we evolve over time in our cities. So um, when it comes to, in particular, in the case of the Netherlands, uh, as you might imagine, we have the bloodstream of the metropolitan area are really the public transport facilities uh, and how they interact with different access and egress modes. Um, and you can see here the shares of specifically soft modes, walking and cycling being very high into public transport systems. Um, and then with, of course, the good uh, livability that comes with it and the efficiency, there are also issues of crowding management. And we have currently very little data on soft modes. And this is a big issue in Amsterdam um, and in other cities as well. And we have to be better, get better in uh, figuring out how we can collect data effectively about 
uh, pedestrians, for example, here you can see from Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, uh, so we can get information about uh, probes from, um, from pedestrians, but also how we can analyze it in a more effective way. This is specifically important in events, big events like the biggest party in Holland, which is King's Day, uh, which takes uh, place every year uh, in April. And then you can see here the big orange crowd, um, but also there are some issues that come with it, such as uh, emergency situations in the public transport systems. And using uh, smart car data, we can analyze how these dynamics uh, travel patterns evolve over the day, which are very different from any other day of the year. Um, emergencies are obviously things that we cannot collect data very effectively on, uh, uh, fortunately because there are very few and also because of we cannot experiment with it much. So we construct gaming simulation techniques in order to gain more data about how people actually uh, behave in such situations. So here is, for example, a gaming simulation, um, which you have an avatar uh, where you play within the simulation, uh, and you have a set of emergency situations, you have to react, you have to choose different modes. And I cannot show the whole video, but here you can see how people actually move within the simulation and what they play together, watch out for 28, and you will see soon they currently watch a concert, but then there is an announcement where there is an earthquake. And then 28 will soon react to this announcement. You can see him now going for its exit, and then you can see this herding behavior, people following him and potentially actually creating uh, more dangerous situations. So in UML, we want to build up on the amount of data that we have from different sources, being able to develop different simulation techniques and modeling techniques in order to make sense out of this data, getting information and hopefully also new knowledge. And doing this by focusing on particular cases and then being able to build up our competence and demonstrate it with certain number of applications. So this is currently something that is under construction. It's a work in progress and we're looking also for other partners who are interested in sharing the same kind of vision that we have. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Okay, our next presentation um, comes from Matthew George, who's uh, CEO of Bridge. So this idea that when you have a desire to travel somewhere, uh, maybe rather than having to conform to prearranged bus routes and all the rest of it, maybe uh, data and collecting of that and all the rest of it allows the route uh, and the bus to uh, work to your needs. So that's working with some very interesting developments in technology and data. So to offer us a little bit about that and maybe some of the messages emerging, please welcome to the platform, Matthew George. Welcome. Thank you. So I, uh, I accidentally planned a business trip to Amsterdam on King's Day and that was the craziest thing that's ever happened to me. That is just absolutely nuts. It's, it's millions of people. I've never seen more people in my life in an urban center than in, on King's Day in, in Amsterdam. So what I don't want to focus on here, guys, in sort of the very short time that we have is what we're doing. What I do want to focus on is sort of some of the bigger problems that we're solving and really sort of you know, why, why we're here. So for the first time this year, and this is the first time in human history, if you take an average person in the entire world it's more likely than not that that person is living in a city. In 2013 and 2014, for the first time in human history, we have 51% of the world's populations living in cities. That's huge, I mean, we can't ignore that. So because of that huge shift, we really have to think about how our cities work and how people get around their cities. And what I really sort of wanna, wanna draw attention to is how that mode of transportation needs to change with a changing city. And to really highlight that home, you know, I'll talk about what's happening here in Boston and what's happening here all over the country. So if you take 10 average people in Boston, living in the Boston metropolitan area, and say, we want you to access the jobs that you are qualified for, only three out of those 10 people are able to access their qualified job uh, within 90 minutes on public transportation here in Boston. That's not my number, that's the Brookings Institution number. Go on their website, Brookings Institution, uh, and search for the city transit access, and you can see it in your city. So this is a huge problem, guys. I mean, this is a massive problem. If we're talking about making cities better, we're talking about making cities more equitable, and without a car, we only have 30% of our population on average, and that's sort of the national number as well, that can access a job via 90 minutes on public transportation. And if people can't access jobs, 
They can access social mobility. They can access cultural mobility. And in combination, that really is a huge stranglehold for our cities in general. So what we at Bridge are trying to do uh, is invent a better way for people to move dynamically from where they are to where they need to go, agnostic of any preconceived notion of a transportation system within a city. And that's a little controversial. Uh, and and you know, we, we, we go back and forth all the time on it. But it's really, really important for us to think sort of down to the first principle of people are somewhere, and they need to go somewhere else. So just to sort of draw this in further contrast, the way we've delivered mass transportation here in Boston and all over the country. So everybody here in Boston like rips on the T and the B line and, and, and all that. Uh, but we actually have one of the best transportation systems in the country here. But just to draw a comparison, the first underground subway in Boston, in the world, I'm sorry, was here right in Boston. And unfortunately in Boston, that hasn't changed in about 110 years. So as our cities are getting bigger, as our cities are getting denser, as people need to interact with their city and people need to embrace living in a city, the core of what makes our city great and the core of what makes a city livable hasn't really changed. So just to sort of give an example of sort of the problem that we try to overcome, I just want to show a brief set of slides without commentary. So when we're, when we're looking at how we deliver better transportation in cities, we really need to rethink some of the core principles of how we think about it. We might not be right, but at least we're trying something new. So our idea at Bridge is to sort of disrupt this single-use transportation model. Forever, we've had one user that needs to go to one destination, and we put them in one car, at least in the United States. Um, and now we've sort of come up with uh, sort of the concept of carpooling, which has been around for 30 or 40 years, where we take a bunch of users, pool them together, express to a destination set, and drop them off individually. But really, you know, if we have some folks in sort of the civil engineering world here, that's pretty inefficient. Um, so what we are doing at Bridge is essentially aggregating users and aggregating their destinations. So we're looking at billions of data points a day to understand where people are moving throughout cities. Once we understand where people are moving throughout cities, we're pre-deploying a small 13-passenger shuttle bus within the city of Boston based on that predicted movement. When a user comes into the system and says, hi, my name is Matt, I'm here, I need to go there, we match them to a pop-up mass transportation spot based on predictive analytics, based on all the data that we've been able to collect. So in a perfectly dense world, you could have millions of pop-up mass transportation stops that were literally being generated based on how people, Jesus Christ, um, based on how people were moving throughout the city. Um, so in essence, that is what we're doing here at Bridge. And what we've been able to provide here in Boston is some pretty incredible numbers. Um, so if you're looking at sort of the cost efficiency of transit, it's very, very cost efficient, but very time inefficient. And if you're looking at a car, it's very cost inefficient, but very time efficient. So sort of by providing a data-driven, if you will, third mode, we're able to go somewhere in the middle and provide people a real third option within the city. So just to sort of give you some numbers about uh, how it's worked here in Boston, we've been able to get 53, up to 53% uh, of commute times reduced for a huge number of our users here in Boston by just more closely matching their origin destination sets. We're still far away. This gentleman here is laughing, so I guess we, we, uh, we, we amused him somehow. Um, but uh, we, we're still really, really, really far uh, way away from making this accessible to everyone, but it's a huge, huge, huge plus in the right direction. So that is what we're doing at Bridge. And one of the things that I would like everybody to sort of go away from this thinking is how we can go back to sort of the first principles, understand what the problems are in our cities, and really just rethink from the ground up how we can solve them. We're not perfect, but we're trying something new, and we're really, really, really excited to be here. So thank you so much. Great job. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, indeed, uh, Matthew. And uh, looking forward to opening up, up, up the conversation around what some of those principles and values are. Um, OK, our next uh, presentation, moving on. I'm delighted that Marta uh, Gonzalez, uh, assistant professor at MIT, uh, is with us, uh, very much trying to meld together kind of physics and urban transportation planning. 
She'll probably explain more, but I think it's about this development, this idea of kind of urban physics and how that can be involved in thinking about sort of community uh, computer models uh, for urban activity patterns. So to tell us a little bit more about that interesting fusion of disciplines, delighted to, to welcome Marta to the platform. Hi. I'm afraid that horn will go off after five Hello. minutes, but you can knock it on the head, all right. All right, thank you very much. I, I'm gonna have my uh, two cents in this discussion. And we come from civil engineering where the know-how of how these models were built. I call it data-driven, always has been data-driven. In order to model demand, you need data. Then, do we really need it? Are we gonna discover something different? Well, the big data is just because with that, uh, we can reverse a little bit the process. It's not about before, they, it, it was too hard. You got 1% of the population, you create a synthetic population, and then you learn the models. Now it's totally reversed. We get massive amount of data. It doesn't look like population. You learn how to uh, tackle a model and then do the solution. What's the great thing about it? It's cheap because it's uh, passive data. And second, uh, those are not synthetic population, are the actual users you had to begin with. Then let's see, why do we need, what's different? It's just the same information. Well, this is one user. Then you would say this data is crazy or you would start predicting much more trips than occur. Who the heck is this person? He's my student, should we, is Jameson Tool, should we fire him? No, we need learning from the data. Never say the data is wrong because it's not human eye, it's machine learning in general. Once, but then comes the thing. You do the computer science method, we find his stays. This is a year data, it's those red and yellow are the cluster location, his lab, everything where he is. Then, when we do that from phone users, that is how our uh, phone user data look like in Boston, what we discover? We discover those, voila, we discover, rediscover the wheel. People move like this despite the huge new data. However, these are not surveys, are all the time your phone. Now with the scary part again. And you may be wondering now, where the physics come from? Well, amazing as it may seem, it's there. Just because the old hard topic is bringing new thinking, is amazing things you can discover. To model people, it's a mark of process, basically. You can do that depending where you are, you have two uh, decisions to make. You stay at home or you go to the next flexible activity. And based on that, the ubiquitous or the universal thing is people put the errands one after the other. And you can, so the trip change distribution, because physicists love distributions, can be explained with a very simple model. Then we have not only the clean data, we have the information about modeling, and it's Markov, meaning if you have an app, you have only one, two transition probabilities. It's very effective. <laughs> then, what do we do with that? So the slide, sorry, got uh, a little bit disrupted, but what do we do with that? Now we route them in the streets, and again, we discover that the traffic is full, we cannot do much about it. However, we can still rethink the problem in another way. That is, given a congested road, we know where the users, we're talking about half million, 300,000 users in a population, where do they live from? This is road usage. So the boost, bus, new terms come because now you can reanalyze the system differently, like a complex system. But we need the know-how of everyone because after all, everyone ends up on human decisions. The roads are gonna still be congested if everyone wants to use them. This is about population and finite capacity. We can use information technologies to all together make solutions and make our cities better for everyone. And I don't want you, it's not only about cars, see, the choices is in us to take either the bike or the electric car, everyone has a place. We still need to move, it's the same rule of movement. We are not moving by drones yet. Then, what we're gonna do? What we're gonna do right now is these old transportation models that were in private consultants, very hard to make, now can be easy after five years work, then we can put it online, we can do things, and we can give back the information to the users, the one making the choice, how we are gonna move better with less traffic in a funnier way. And with that, I celebrate that we're here talking about this topic and it's like a pre-Sons giving party. And that's all what I have.
Thank you very much indeed. Brilliant. <coughs> Lovely, and look forward to opening up the conversation in the panel uh, in a few moments. Uh, our final uh, stimulus contribution to this uh, issue around data-driven mobility uh, comes from Katja Schechner, uh, whose uh, dual appointment, both uh, with, uh, within the MIT Media Lab, but also with the Asian Development Bank, and I think very much involved in uh, issues around... Oh, hello, is that... I knew that. I could, that's perfect. Okay. You've sussed the technology. It's simple. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> taking me years, I can tell you. Um, so, and I think you're very much looking around sort of data research uh, projects and issues around urban mobility and where investments should be made. So it'd be interesting to hear some of the findings you're finding out related to data and mobility. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome. Um, and thanks, Marta. We've been working together in the past and usually I'm a very much like advocate, like the good new big data, how we can use it. Unfortunately, Marta, today I'm here to ruin the party. Uh, so I will talk about big data and transportation in Southeast Asia. We talk about 600 to 700 million of people. It's a big market. It's 70% of China, uh, we, we, but do we know anything about it? So I want to take you on a journey, okay? Go with me to Singapore. Let's start in a wonderful data-rich um, city where we have knowledge about who are there, how, where do the people live, how many households, what are the demographics. We also have like sensor networks, we have cameras, we have um, inductive loop sensors and we can have the mobile phone data, we have weather stations and then you come up with like a, after a lot of work with some of the brilliant work the Sensible City Lab did about uh, Singapore and life Singapore and transportation in Singapore. But what I want to talk about is uh, people rich transportation. Travel with me to Vietnam, to Malaysia, to the Philippines, to Bali, and suddenly, when you think and look into data, and that is actually currently my job at the uh, Asian Development Bank and World Bank projects, to understand transportation data and build the transportation statistics and outlook for Asia, this is what happens. We are blindfolded, and with blindfolded, I mean we have actually no clue. We do not even know much about the transportation infrastructure, the streets out there. The data is scarce, it's fragmented, and the few data sets we have from like World Bank set data sets or better national governments are so, are so overused and so extrapolated that if you took a small European state, Monaco, and tried, because you have a lot of data, they're rich, you know anything, and model the transportation networks and ideas in a suburban Atlanta. That's what we're currently doing. Or actually, we're trying to take this, the, the data from Mon Monaco and model everything from Italy to the whole of US. Um, now, getting so I was thinking like, hmm, it takes a while to build up the statistics, to put out the sensors, to put all the networks. Why don't we use big data? We leapfrog, we look into mobile phone data, we look into GPS data, and shouldn't that you know, bring us up to speed? Actually, what happens very quickly when you look into it, it's, uh, so what we did is, we did a study in Southeast Asia with a brilliant intern from, from Sloan School of Management and Harvard, Kennedy, Ellison, Laporte, Oshiro. We looked at each country and looked at what initiatives are currently happening there on the legal, on the policy space, but really on the ground. This is, this is the total of what's currently happening in a country of 100 million people. Um, quickly jumping into it, mobile phone data. Of course they had an idea about it. Of course they wanted to do it. It was like the University of Tokyo that uh, helps them and Chaika, some funds helping them to look at it. It was incredibly stalled. They, it's, it's not as if you go into a developing country and suddenly there is no privacy rules or there is no authority that looks into data privacy or anything like this. And it's also the companies that want to make their money there. But what we actually found, and what was even more frightening for us, it's 97% of the data, mobile phone data contracts are prepaid, which means the companies do not store the data. So unfortunately, Marta, as we put the data, <laughs> we cannot use it. Jump a little bit further, uh, GPS-based, so you've seen probably the brilliant research that Sarah Williams has done with uh, tracking, uh, informal transit. How much is informal transit in this country, by the way? It's 60 to 90% of people are using informal transport modes. If you try to imagine, we are talking about countries where there is 9 to 30 motor vehicles, that includes buses and everything, per thousand people, okay? So it's cramped, it's, in, it's informal, and it, very little of it is like formal. So 
jump further. So we did it. We have a little project. We, we look at it, but again, it's stalled. It's stalled also because of the cost of just a phone like this. Vietnam. Vietnam is actually very forward-looking. Uh, it even came up with a government <coughs> transportation strategy, an idea strategy. They also work together uh, with a very variation of uh, industries to look into um, GPS data collection, into developing apps, and all these kinds of apps. But why is it so important that technology and what we're looking in back data is tied to cultures? Well, they had an ITS strategy. They invited big companies to go in there. I'm not talking about mobile phone data or GPS data. I'm talking about already proven technology. Big company brings in inductive loop sensors to control traffic lights. Proven. We do that for less. You know what? There is no cars, honey. And with the inductive loop sensors, you cannot count them. So again, we put in a big technology, we gather data, we actually operationalize it. Well, culture eats technology for breakfast. That's what I, I gain in there. Um, as I'm, as I'm uh, should be finishing over here, see, I can use the technology. Um, <coughs> just quickly, where do we stand in overall? This is our preliminary fi findings. Philippines and Vietnam are actually very much advanced. There is little or no discussion or activity in many of the other countries. Singapore is heading along. And uh, what I want to discuss with you and what I want to understand is big data for leapfrogging transport planning and operation in developing countries. When will it really be available in a society where this is worth $40,000? And how much Uber would you use if this is $40,000 and your driver probably makes 20 a year? Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. So again, whoa, lots of issues that were... Um, were raised. I, I'm going to take a, not take a risk here, but you're such an active group, you could come in a whole set of points on this. So who would like to, I'm going to lead from the floor, who'd like to start with a reaction, a thought, an idea? Okay, faster than a flying Segway, get down there. Fantastic. Uh -huh. <laughs> Whatever happened to Segway? Well, we've not discussed the Segways. Flew, the no, owner flew you. off a mountain on a Segway. They, what? <laughs> yes. get the, it's too great. Our office is directly next to a Segway tour place. So, so flying Segway they, might have been They too give soon. tours all the time. Okay, but this is unhappy ending. <laughs> okay, <laughs> get us back on track, please. You are. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm a graduate student from the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Do you come uh, with a name? Anisha. My name is Anisha. Fantastic. <laughs> um, Thank you for the you know, very interesting uh, introductions to the panel. And I'm so glad we have someone like Katya speaking about developing countries because I was doing research on urban mobility in uh, Nairobi over the summer. And it's a very similar situation as um, Asian developing countries. In fact, my comment to what you said is um, it's not just smartphones and when they will get to these places because uh, in Nairobi you can get one for as little as $40 and that, that's a significant amount but people are willing to spend that sort of money these days. Um, but despite that, it's more about the context of you know, what infrastructure the city is lacking and whether smart solutions can actually be implemented or not. And I'll just give you an example since you spoke about IBM Smarter Cities in so many different places, right? They, they implemented um, a program in Nairobi but, um, to, to um, decrease road congestion, but it doesn't really work because people tend to steal cameras off the roads. <laughs> or you have Google trying to implement cashless payment systems on the uh, public transport system there, and that doesn't work because they want people to have Gmail IDs, and a lot of people don't even use internet. So my okay. question after that comment is really how can this context be taken into consideration beyond just smartphone penetration and things like that? Okay, let's bring the real world into the conversation. Um, I mean. Katya, you, you made a couple of comments. That probably reinforces your point. Uh, uh, I don't know whether you want to say anything further, and then I'll <laughs> see whether anyone's got a reaction. Just qu the, the major point was made. It's like the eyes and views we have uh, when we look at in our data-rich societies and where we feel like connected. 
it, it is not working the same way in developing countries due to a variety of issues. And actually, I'm, look, I'm here to look to people to work with me on the research issues. What does it mean for urban mobility? What help, how does it help me to understand, plan, and operate better in, in an environment that, that functions like this? Mm. Martin, do you want to sure. offer a, uh, <laughs> a I reaction? Think, uh, we need to be super clear on the message. I come from a developing country. We do not most in developing world follow everything that the developed world does because we never get there. Uh, please, you do not, you do not need a smartphones for this. That's the good news. I work with mobile phone data because phone data is a technology cheap mobile phone, any phone data. And you know what? In the slums in Caracas and in Rio, the fixed lines do not arrive but everyone wants to communicate. I have worked in the slums, people is, as everyone, the motive are gonna be the same, trip change, time budget, 24 hours, some of us are uh, much further away from work, and it's a constrained environment. I'm working with uh, phone data from Bogota, and uh, little things which is fascinating for, for city science. Within the radios I have in Boston, that every show I show you is in Boston, Within the same radius, I have seven times more people. So one something million to six something million. Definitely, that is a complicated place to work with. To the young students here, do not buy the I don't have the data, I'm gonna do nothing. No, the data is there, the company has to give it to you. And if they are not recording it, start recording it. Okay. Because it's not, it cannot be expensive, it can be there. Matthew, do you want to chip in there? Yeah, no, I, I agree wholeheartedly with Marta. So, so we now sort of get the opportunity to go all over the world and sort of see sort of some of the, some of the networks that Katya was talking about uh, sort of in her talk about 60 to 90% of uh, sort of city travel in some areas being, you know, on, informal. So in Bogota, uh, especially with sort of, even with sort of the, the Transmillennia sort of BRT network, there's still a huge network of sort of informal bus transit. So I think to Marta's point, one of the things that, that is potentially really interesting is being able to work with what we have, right, and work with the infrastructure we have, which is sort of the tuk-tuk networks or any one of these other informal transit networks, and being able to do minor improvements to make that a little bit more accessible rather than sort of uh, very, very high-level <laughs> stuff that we're you know, always going to be waiting for better data on. OK. I can add on it. Yeah. Um, I was working with party transport operators for control strategies and had some experience in, in Stockholm and in, in Holland. And then he used really real-time location of buses in order to try to regulate the headways between buses. Uh, but then in Santiago de Chile, where you have, uh, before they had the Transantiago system, when you have a lot of, I think, 14,000 individual operators of buses in Santiago, yeah. actually they had their own self-organizing control strategy. So what drivers did was they paid people informative sitting next to stops about the headway from the previous bus. So sometimes you can have actually have a superior control system, which is <laughs> bottom up rather than top down in such cases. And if you just give them a little bit of technology. Yep. Right. OK, interesting. OK, I, I'm going to open up another, another theme. OK, whilst you're thinking about I'm going to come to, I feel I need well, to I actually have a, I have a question. So like, you know, coming from a startup consumer product background, like we're very much in this like lean startup, minimum viable product, like you get the simplest thing out there to see if your solution works. And you iterate on that. You come into it assuming that you have a biased point of view and that you can't solve someone's problem you know, completely and then give it to them and say, this is the solution. When you're dealing with something at the scale of a, of a city, these huge networks, like, how do you do that when, I mean, do these things need to be huge for you to know if they work? Or how do you mitigate that, those issues? I mean, I'm like giving someone you know, my, our app and saying, like, does this work for you? No, back to the drawing board. How do you do that on this scale? Yeah, I mean, so what we did in Boston, I mean, we just looked at uh, uh, sort of a bunch of, of data. We hired, first step, hire a bunch of really smart people from MIT, which we did. Um, <laughs> They're smart people. I, I know, I know. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, I, I'm not from MIT, so I, any, anybody that's it, it's smarter than me. So, and then we looked at a bunch of data, and we put a stupid, simple, scheduled route down. We said, okay, well, where are the pain points in the city that you know, are, are identified by a couple billion data points that we went through and said, okay, we're going to do this stupid, stupid, simple. We're, we're going to put up on the website an ability for somebody to purchase a ticket just like they do on Amtrak. And we got a bus and then we had a paper check-in list and said, does this work for you? <laughs> Once it worked for two months, then we started to roll out more and more technologies. So I think also back to Marta's point of saying, work with the stuff you have 
and just try something, right? Mm -hmm. I think there's sort of a, an inherent desire to just sort of postulate and things okay. forever. I just want to develop, the, I mean, one of your questions that you had at I had the a lot end. Of, I had you a lot you of had a lot of questions, that's right. Uh, this is the space for them. But one of the concerns was about this issue, and I know it's, it, it runs through the whole conference today in bigger issues, is about that, uh, that the kind of data protection, the nervousness of what that information is going to be used for and all the rest of it. And it's a while, I have a, I have a very human problem. It, suddenly my thing comes up and says, do you want to sell your soul to the devil? <laughs> yes, no. Ooh, I think I'll push no. And therefore I have denied the development of a beautiful transport system in Bath in the UK. Uh, and I'm just wondering around just whether we could open up just a short conversation further around these issues of, you know, of big data and a human hesitancy to, you know, just a, re a feeling that, that we're getting into a world that's, that's scary. And also businesses like you who have a reputation and a trust with your, your clients and your, your customers uh, which is possibly unnecessarily inhibiting interesting data from being available to uh, to help with smart planning. I just wonder if anyone wanted to, where, where, how do we, where are we at on that, and how do we move forward, or is that just a tension of life? Catcher. Um, no, putting on my MIT hat and not my developing country that doesn't work, Cat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> What we have like here at Media Lab is like Sandy Pentland working with the World Economic Forum on developing models for like how private companies can actually use the data they have in mind if in a business model like sell the location data and the information you have on where the next Starbucks should go because how people move. If in the same way you donate the data or you give the data and the same value to the public, uh, to the governments to actually uh, in the, uh, plan and better, better to the society or governments work better on it. Like have this trade-off between if you're a private company and you have valuable data set, uh, how can we uh, sell it, but how can we in, in, in certain forms of aggregation and privacy and also like probably link it, link it to uh, governmental to administration to the greater public good uh, by giving some of it free. So this is this is this is maybe a direction in which we can go and facing, and that would, you know, allow you to understand that you you when you give your data, it will actually go to Bath, and but probably also the Starbucks will pop up in the in the neighborhood that <laughs> generates the most money. So it's okay. a trade-off. Does anyone else want to offer a... I love her when she has the MIT hat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have a paper together. I, want, no, I wanted to say, regarding the adoption and the boring apps, um, the, somehow the dream or an, an example I can think of is Waze. So people do does it for a reason, and in Rio they are using it to say where are the dangerous spots to park your car. And other bad things like if... Uh, young population is uh, drinking and driving, they also say where the police are. So it's totally self-organized system, and they are using the app to do that. So hopefully we can just plug in the information so based on demand, optimize the solutions, and have like the page rank of those apps. That would be some sort of way to okay. think about it. I mean, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, well, no, I mean, no what we, I mean, what we find when we talk to users is just overwhelmingly a lot of people don't really understand, and you can't really understand until you see the scale of the data that is being collected, like how much about them is being tracked by these apps. And it's hard to know, like, how much of that does the app really need to survive? Like, Waze is, is free. You know, our app is free. And the, the free part is no free lunch, is that you're giving up this data in exchange for that. But I'm not convinced that people really understand that. I don't think it has to be a, like a Faustian bargain, but there's, you're giving something up and people don't, aren't making that choice consciously. And every, every way that I think people try to help them make that choice consciously, they just get scared off. And then yeah. you know, apps like yeah. ours can't survive in that ecosystem. So it seems like, I mean, we definitely struggle with this. I think a lot of products do that are in this data-driven world. Like giving it away for free to everyone doesn't work for us because we need you know, we're a startup, we're not making a profit yet, right. and we'd, love, we'd like to figure out a way to, so we, I can continue to have a job. <laughs> um, so it's hard. Okay. Matt, did you want to offer a perspective on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's actually sort of a, a good target for uh, regulatory oversight. I, I mean, I think, I, think it, I think it actually comes down to that. I mean, so we'll just give you sort of the example that, that and this is not, you know, a jump on Uber thing, but 
Uh, we'll give you the example of what happened with Uber over the past couple of days. You know, they, they found out they were able to pull up individual users' transit history as sort of like a party trick. And for me, as somebody who's not competitive with Uber, but tangentially competitive with Uber, <laughs> using Uber to get to venture capital meetings, to get to business meetings, that was really scary for me, that somebody would be able to pull that up and see where I was going. So I think one of the things that could be really, really, really vital to this whole process is essentially a, an agreed upon standard for location, especially location data. But on the other flip side of the coin, none of this would be possible without the digital exhaust that we are all putting off in terms of location information. So I, I think there, there needs to be some sort of an intervention to you know, separate the good from the bad, but I don't think we should go all the way to the other end of the spectrum because none of these great innovations that folks are talking about up here would be possible without that digital okay. exhaust. I, I just wanted, um, anyway, I'm on behalf of the human race here, <laughs> uh, I just wonder whether we're possibly underestimating a, a, an emerging human resistance and concern about I as a human individual, I suddenly find that my, my CCTV in my baby's cot is now being live streamed in Russia. Um, you know, I saw that on the news. Uh, I, I, and, I'm just, I, and I'm just, I'm just feeling more uncomfortable than you think <laughs> I'm. And you need to, I just wonder whether there needs to be more of a response than our dinosaur, get out of the way, this is the way forward, and, and whether we're actually underestimating a, a, a deep set of anxieties and nervousnesses which are going to catch you out because you kind of think, oh, silly people, once they get a smartphone and they manage to get a quick taxi, they'll be fine. I just want to... I just wanted you to push back on me and no, say, you're not, oh, you're not underestimating. You're not, you're totally not underestimating. You're, you think you're underestimating until you see these crazy stories that come out. And then you're like, oh shit, for every one crazy story that comes out, how many crazy stories are not coming out about how people are using this data? So I, I think it, it, it really is one of the biggest challenges that we'll have to face. And, and well, what's your response to, uh, and you know, what would, what would your message be to those of us in the technology world that are driving forward? Don't be an idiot. Um, <laughs> and, and, and also, uh, like Katya was saying, what was you know, essentially partner in providing that data to academic institutions and other places yeah. that tend to keep you a little bit more honest. OK. Yeah, Marshall My and Nick. My response would be, guess what? Governments has it, the data, your data. They already have it. Google has it, too. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm we a want to do uh, transportation planning and epidemic spreading. Would you share your, your data with us? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I, you just spooked me even more. <laughs> Nick, I just, I just, oh, just real quick, I mean, I think, I think part of it too is just, oh, this is very new. So, I mean, there's an element of trust. Like, I, I trust when I walk down the street that people aren't going to beat me up, or when I walk by a cop, he's not going to pull out his gun and shoot me. And part of that is just because there's a whole set of ethics and rules and things that have evolved. And concealed this that, carry laws. Yeah. <laughs> So I think that you know this data is so new, and so some of this party trick thing is that there's a novelty to it, right? Like the the weight and import of like we trust people to do responsible things with mm -hmm. dangerous stuff all the time in our society, but just the weight and importance of that data isn't impressed wasn't impressed upon me in my education because data science didn't exist when I went to school, you know. So I think that takes some time, okay. but it's a conversation that needs to happen. Yeah, oh, yeah I would like to give just a bit more maybe nuanced perspective on it, because I think we tend to focus on you know, Google and Apple, those kind of uh, data that they collect. Um, but I think it really matters whether it's governmental or cooperative data, uh, who is the owner. Um, so for example, when it comes to smart card data, which is owned by the public transport agency, you might be more willing to share the data. And this also may vary from country to country, of course, it depends on the trustworthy of the government as well. Um, so when it comes to smart card data, for example, you might be willing to have an anonymous data or card and share this information. And if not, I think in Holland, when you can choose whether to have an anonymous card or an individual card, and 90% choose to have an individual card. So they're willing to have it in order right. to uh, gain some comfort. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm going to open up uh, maybe another stream lady at the front here. Just wave in a, a lovely. Well, I would like to add a little bit of... You are? Um, my name is Małgorzata. I am uh, from Sensible City Lab now. And normally I am from Lodz University of Technology in Poland. And I would like to, to add to this discussion a little bit of bottom-up approach, because you are mostly discussing it top-down. And, uh, well, I witnessed uh, such... Uh, absolutely uh, self-organized uh, activities when people... Uh, 
purposefully collected the location data in order to convince local government agencies that they use it in a certain way. It mostly referred to bicycle, bicycles mm -hmm. uh, who just uh, voluntarily shared uh, the data to, to get new bicycle lanes. And I witnessed it many times, not only, it refers not only to Poland, but to other countries as well. So, so it happens as well, and that people want to share. And, and is your sense that, that is, that's, a, that's a growing movement? So the, the I think that it can be used as another public participation method. Right. In planning, uh, similarly to you know sharing uh, uh, answers to some qu questions, uh, spending time on uh, being engaged, yeah. people want to share also their location okay. data. Th thank you for that. I'm going to take one at the back and then a lady further forward. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, it's Simon Giles here. I run Accenture's Cities Practice, and in response to the the comments about data and who do you trust. We're doing some work in Copenhagen at the moment, and one of the things that the city there is trying to do is understand how could they develop an urban information marketplace to take both public sector data, open data, but also private proprietary data sets that come out of companies and provide one marketplace, so effectively develop the infrastructure for urban information transactions. Now, the key question behind that is, who do you trust to be the broker of your data if you are the public sector, the private sector, or an individual? And does the technology exist to be able to allow that enterprise to be able to manage your data and broker your data and allow you to monetize that data? So one of the things they're looking at is the hub of all things, uh, HAT, the technology for, for being able to collect that data and then protect it and broker it on your behalf. Do you think, as a panel, that there's an opportunity for new or old enterprise structures like mutual societies to be able to operate on the behalf of consumers to aggregate and broker data so that there is no profit motive? Ultimately, any profit that's generated goes back into right. yeah. the mutual yeah. organization. Like a bank account. Who'd like to offer a response? I mean, I got into like a screaming match at an Intelligent Transportation Systems Conference with not Accenture, but a competitor to Accenture, uh, essentially telling all these you know, DOT people and all these you know, sort of government folks, oh, give us, give us, give us your data. You, you don't know what to do with it. Give it, give it to us. <laughs> We're going to put it on a little black box. And then, oh, so, sorry, private company, or sorry, you know, Sensible Cities Lab, or sorry, you know, other folks who want to use it. Yeah, in order to really see what's in the black box, you have to pay this sum of money. And even if it's public and private data, that is really, 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 I think, a scary precedent. The public data belongs to the public. It is a public information source. I get so nervous because of what we have to deal with to get the data uh, that should be public data for you know, transportation planning. It really makes me nervous. The perfect example is our cities that use traffic counters that are from private companies. You talk to the city, and they say, oh, well, it's X traffic counter company's data. And then we're like, no, it's not. It's your data, because it's public data paid with public <laughs> funds. And then it ends up in this huge sort of circular thing where you have to threaten to sue somebody before you get it. So I think that's a very, very dangerous road to go down. And I, I think it should be the responsibility of places like Sensible Cities Lab or MIT or uh, you know, Georgia Tech or Stanford or one of the other really, 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 really big transportation think tanks to aggregate that responsibly. And OK, catch it. Just, just to, to tell you how far some of this is already our AirSage has, is launching in today or tomorrow uh, uh, together with SAP, a model where they actually include mobile phone data. Uh, oh, no, not, not mobile phone, I don't know. Mobility data. Mobility data oh, of no, people no. taking from the different sources they have it with trading and trading options. Okay, that's what, how they get so that traders can better understand and understand and assess risks for certain uh, industries in certain countries. So this is, this is where we are currently when we talk about, and, and uh, AirSage gets the data from the big uh, mobile phone operators, aggregated, but still they get it. So the question is, am I as a person who's actually now spending and funding all these things, shouldn't, shouldn't I get paid back? 
uh, for my mobile phone company because they are selling my data? Or should I be, as a, as a human being who takes part in a society, actually, what is private about of me and what is public about me? And, okay. and we are walking fast there. Yeah, okay. I'm going to take one more uh, quick question and then we'll be hurtling towards... Uh, I'm Gillian Crampton-Smith from uh, Venice, Italy. Uh, I'd like to point out that there's a very different approach to privacy in, in Europe and in America. And if you think, it's only 25 years since the Berlin Wall came down when people discovered that a third of the population of East Germany was spying on their neighbors. So this is very, very alive for us. And, and I think people are not taking it seriously enough. Um, and a lot of people, um, big companies, are, are kind of bullying their way ahead and saying, well, you know, look at the advantages. Well, I think we should be thinking about the disadvantages. OK, thank you very much for that. I'm just coming, going to come to all the panel in a moment just to maybe, again, to send a, uh, a let's, as we go into lunch, take-home message. I just want to come to you first, Matthew. I was just struck by something you were saying about all this stuff going on, but we need to re rethink our core principles about kind of what we're trying to achieve. And, and I, I, I just wanted to give you a space to, to, to just develop that slightly more, because it struck me it could be that it resonates with the two previous conversations about kind of what are we about and I think what we're trying to achieve. And I, I just wonder whether you just want to elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, just, just sort of looking around in sort of the brief times here this morning and, and just sort of meeting everybody here, I mean, this is probably one of the most incredible gra gatherings of people from all over the world who fundamentally care about making cities better. I don't pretend to have anywhere close to your experience in doing this. We've surrounded ourselves with people like Gabe Klein, David Lockchacker, tons and tons of really good people who do. But I think this is an opportunity to really rethink basic principles and to say, what are the basic things that make cities work? I don't have the answers. You don't have the answers. But I think we're living in an age now where we can sort of rapidly prototype a technology to be able to solve some of these core fundamental principles. So I think one of the best things that we can take away from today, and one of the best things I can take away from today, is the opportunity for us to all sort of work together, not sort of the academic world, not necessarily sort of the vendor world, not necessarily the technology world, but really form those close collaborations uh, to be able to sort of rethink some of those basic principles about how we deliver some of our core services like transportation, and just sort of start with a blank slate, sit in a room, uh, sort of talk about some ideas, and then rapidly prototype rather than sort of talking about it for 10 years and okay. then planning for another 30. Uh, thank you very much for that. And I just, from the other panelists, uh, you know, a kind of w long one-liner take home, either that you're taking home or you think we should take home, particularly related to this data-driven mobility issue. Uh, just, Marta, would you like to offer a... You could even make it very short. Um, yeah, let's uh, focus not in the bad part of the data, Let's make a, a look for our right to use it as an opportunity as everything in life. Okay, Nick. I mean, for me, it's just we like I see the great value in this data. I see that how how we can all help each other, and it's for me, it's just it's the how. How do how do corporations partner with academic institutions? How do we uh, you know the actual right. owners of the data, our users? How do we work with them so that we can get the most value for everyone out of out of this data? Added. Also reflecting on the discussion we had, I would say that data is, uh, will become valuable only if we embed our values in it and how we make sense out of it and what kind of cities we want to, to develop based on this kind of data and what, how we want to share data with other users. So I think that's the main message that I have. Okay. Yeah, Good while job. I'm um, building on that is when we build our values in it, just let's imagine that like there is culture, there's different cultures out there everywhere, and that not one culture has conquered, China has not conquered Asia, uh, America is leading probably the West, but not conquered Italy or, or, or Spain completely in the culture. So probably let me finish with a sentence like, culture eats technology for breakfast. <laughs> okay, <laughs> brilliant. For lunch. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. our panel, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.